So with that brief introduction over, if you want more details about the, the panelists, you can find them on the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Medicine website. They're extremely nicely arranged there. Um, but we have, I think, some questions which we should address to the panel. And um, perhaps what we will do is to ask the, this, this first question. Baron, if we'll ask you first, but then just so Betsy is not uh, blindsided, we'll ask Betsy the same question second, and then we'll move our attention to Lindsay. So the, the question uh, is, has the COVID-19 pandemic affected the way the clinical research community shares data and knowledge? And just let me give you the sub question so you have the full picture. And in what ways has COVID-19 facilitated data and knowledge sharing? And perhaps in what ways has it hindered data and knowledge sharing? So well, maybe I... Over to me, okay. I, I would like to start with uh, actually repeating what somebody said this morning from our Dutch funder Zon and Wei on this topic. And she said, under high pressure, everything becomes fluid. And what she meant was that a lot of things that were prevented by all kinds of bureaucracy suddenly became possible because of the high pressure uh, inserted by the COVID situation. So that's the good news that uh, I, my statement has always been effective data sharing, I'll nuance that term in a sec, um, has always been technically possible and 90% of the bottlenecks why it's not happening are not technical but social and uh, very much related to data uh, you know, being not seen as of value, only scientific papers with high impact factors and so on. So those are the social issues. But I would like to come back to the term data sharing as such. Um, I now start my lectures on FAIR and everything related to it. Um, of course, data have to be first findable, then secondly, accessible, then interoperable for machines, and then only then they are reusable. Um, but my lectures frequently start with the end of data sharing. And that sort of puts people on the wrong leg, but because if you say data sharing, every scientist or doctor or whatever, I'm in a medical hospital, uh, thinks sending physically data across the internet to somebody else, losing control, potentially violating GDPR, all these things. So then I nuance that statement by saying we are moving from data sharing to data visiting. So the data stay where they are, and the smart algorithms go to the data, ask access and run their models and their hypotheses. And COVID has exposed the problems with data sharing enormously. We have struggled for three months to get sufficient data to build a conceptual model and find some new drugs. And uh, it also showed like no other disease so far, maybe except for Ebola, but that was hidden how difficult it is to physically share data. There is no way the Chinese government is allowing to send any data to the United States or the other way around. There's nothing per se to do with the GDPR. This is political. So because the epidemic was so heavily politicized, it brought to the forefront that we can only deal with the learning on real world observations on the new epidemic by visiting the data where they are, rather than sharing them or collecting them centrally. Very good, very good. Thank you. Um, and I, I think, I mean, that the point you make about data sharing, data visiting, I think that um, is an extremely important point. And I recall having a conversation with some people from Humomics England some time ago and they were using a different uh, analogy. They were describing themselves as a as a reading library, not a lending library. But I think it's the same concept of taking the algorithms of data rather than taking the data. To the yeah, maybe if you if you uh, would point it for more lay people that do not know about Docker images and virtual machines. Uh, one of the people, actually this morning I was in a discussion with our Dutch funder, they had decided to finance a movie about FAIR and data stewardship 
we were with the creative people, so I had to explain it. And the lady said, what you actually say is you have a library or a bookshelf, I have a bookshelf, and instead of giving you one of my books, you call me and you say, can I read one book? I said, well, it's even stronger. You probably, can you read page eight from books 12? So the virtual machine only takes the, the results with it and never the personalized data. And you, as the custodian of your own data source in a fair data point, as we call it, or fair data station, you decide which trains, which virtual machines to leave, to let in. And you check them again when they leave, that they don't take any data they are not supposed to take. So this Very is good. the way to stay in tune with GDPR as well. But the political pressure on COVID is unprecedented. Right? Yes, in indeed. And I think perhaps if time allows, and maybe we can have some conversation with um, members from the audience on GDPR, because um, this, this is uh, sometimes quite, quite a challenge. Uh, right, I will move on then to um, Betsy. Betsy, if you'd be so kind, perhaps I should repeat the question for you. Has the COVID-19 pandemic affected the way the clinical research community shares data and knowledge? And in what ways has it facilitated and in what ways has it hindered? So I'll, I'll start by picking up a theme of Barron's comments, which is that I think this pandemic has highlighted many of the problems that arise from the lack of data sharing. And in particular, the, the clinical trial landscape has been flooded with trials that on their own will never be able to give solid evidence for or against any particular clinical decision making. Um, but if the data could be shared, if these trials could be coordinated, we would be in a much better position right now. Um, just to, to put a point on that, there was a, a study that the, the FDA in the US commissioned to look at all of the COVID-19 randomized clinical trials, or sorry, clinical trials that were registered to clinicaltrials.gov in, I think this study happened in maybe June when there were hundreds and hundreds of trials that were going on. And this internal study found that 90% of them were not actionable, meaning they were of such low quality or, too, or the sample size was too small such that the FDA would never base any clinical decision making on these trials. So 90% of the trials that were being run in the US at the beginning of the summer were a waste of time and resources. And I think that's, that's still that this issue is not yet uh, recognized enough to have changed behavior at this point, but I think in a post-mortem, it will be, you know, maybe I, I'm, I'm being slightly optimistic here, but I think it will be really, really hard to ignore that when we're in a position to do a post-mortem on COVID and figure out what we need to do going forward. I know after the Ebola um, pandemic, guidelines were issued that point out exactly these same problems, but I think as Baron said, that was kind of a, a problem that was able to be left invisible to a lot of the people who are being affected by COVID. And I think it will be much harder to ignore in a postmortem of, of COVID. So I'm hopeful that, that in five years, when we come back for a, another panel, we'll, we'll be able to say that COVID did change things for the better. On the, the flip side, I think um, clinical research has been slower to embrace open science than many other areas of science. And I am I worry that the way that non-peer reviewed preprints have been used in this pandemic is going to, to make that embrace even harder. I think it's gonna be, um, we're, we're gonna need, those of us who support open science are gonna need to think really hard about how we balance the concerns over, you know, making things public and able to be used in decision making early versus, um, well, you know, I think the peer review process is broken, so that's not the, the total solution, but I do think that that's been a, a real step backwards that I've been um, disheartened to see. Yeah. John, can I, can I comment on that briefly? Aaron, because, please. Uh, 
the other thing that COVID exposed, uh, I, I hear a number of things of what Betsy says, and I know that she is coming from the right angle, but so frequently people uh, mix up, for example, FAIR with open, and open science with everything is open, and the worst thing, open science is equal to open access articles. It is so that the last figure I heard is that today, 450 papers came out on COVID per day. There's no freaking way we will ever read these papers. Most of them are crap anyway and not going to peer review. So what we have just gotten a proposal accepted to mine them all with a very high level tagger and only look at the new cardinal assertions as we call them, the claims that come out of these papers, like some idiot saying again that hydroxychloroquine will treat uh, uh, COVID. And then we will only review the claims in the papers that are actually new or repetitive and contested because there's not even a way to read all the papers, let alone judge them. And then the data should be published with a supplementary article, not the other way around. Because now we hide our data behind, behind papers that are a nightmare for machines. They don't find the links, the links are broken. We need to publish our data with fair metadata so that the virtual machines can visit them which means that the virtual machines should have fair metadata themselves. The software should be fair compliant. We cannot separate the data anymore from the major reading mechanism and ana analytics mechanism, which is basically software. Now you could yes. argue that software is executable data, but it is an internet of fair data and the accompanying services that we're looking for. And the situation with COVID is so bad that we now have fair data points in many African countries. We were installing one in China. And jean Wee, my vice president in CoData, asked his own CDC to get some real world data to do some testing. Answer is no. They don't even give the, the data from the hospitals in China to a trusted vice president of CoData in charge of the Chinese Open Science Cloud. So what we are doing now is we generate 50,000 synthetic patients by with algorithms filling the WHO CRF with lots of values and data. So we create fake patients, of course, properly notified as being synthetic patients. So we have no GDPR issues. So we can distribute them over the world. And you know, for what stupid reason, we have to convince our own ministry that we can run distributed analytics over these data and that we will get the same result as when we do this on a centralized database. They don't even Aaron, believe it. Ab absolutely. Thank you very much. And you also bring up a point there which maybe we can we can tackle in the in the uh, in the rose garden with our tea and cakes afterwards. And and, and that is the, the, the publishing industry, open science, making the, the, the papers machine readable and all that kind of stuff, which the publishing industry is finding difficult to get its head around a new business model. But going back to Betsy, Betsy, I have a question for you, if I may. And you make this point, and I wrote it down, that um, you have 90% uh, of trials being un unusable. Now, I'm very naive and you're deeply expert, but shouldn't these trials be subject to review by an you know an institutional review board or an ethics committee and isn't it in you know in their remit to to make a comment about whether the trial is is worth doing because having trials of a statistical size which is meaningless is an irresponsible activity i put it to you yes that's absolutely true that that should be happening. And it's not in part because due to faults of the way that internal review boards operate. But another problem is that a problem that IRBs couldn't solve is that there simply aren't enough patients to enroll enough for most of these trials. And so they're, they're they're going to be under, you know, even if even if what the IRB approves is a 400 person trial, this is speaking from actual experience, they're going to have eight patients by the time they've been up and running for for months. That's a, a specific example from my institution. Um, and this is a problem that can be solved by data sharing and knowledge sharing. If you know, there, 
of the, the hundreds and hundreds of inactionable trials, many hundreds of them were for hydroxychloroquine. And if those trials would come together and share their data with one another, we would have a, a huge, well-powered trial. Um, and so I think, I do think that there's some onus on individual IRB boards, but I also think in the absence of data sharing, no decision, no single decision maker has access to all of the knowledge that they need to make a really informed decision. One of the other problems with the lack of data sharing is that we're flooding the, the landscape with repeated trials of the same clinical question that are being run at the same time, and that's inflating the false positive rate across when you look across the research landscape. And that's something that review boards should be wary of, but they just don't have access to the knowledge that would allow them to make good decisions about that. And sure. could, I, could yes. I just really briefly respond to something that Berend said? I think yes. you're absolutely right that I'm, I was conflating um, open science with data sharing. Um, to make it a little, the connection a little more clear, um, I've spoken with a lot of clinical researchers who are, uh, who are wary of making their data public because they're worried that somebody is going to go on a fishing expedition in their data and publish lots and lots of papers that flood the literature with exactly what you said, these 450 new preprints a day, um, and that making, they, they feel that making data public is going to um, exacerbate that problem rather than fix it, which I, you know, I, I disagree with, but I think there's some, some good points there that we're going to have to worry about. <laughs> well, but that is the other thing about data visiting. If I allow at LUMC, we have lots of patients and we measure 96 cytokines on every patient coming in and so on. We now make a fair digital clean of every tumor that comes into the hospital. But I, not, not me personally, but as a doctor, I am the custodian of that data. And if I, I get a virtual machine in, apart from having other restrictions, I can say, I want to be a co-author on your paper if you want to look at my data. And so that not so much that I need another paper, but to be co-controlling that they don't publish a lot of crap based on my data mm -hmm. or not yeah. my data, the data I made with public funding is not my data. Uh, but therefore, and, and it's an un but it's almost impossible, and I know Carol is on the call as well, she will confirm that. You give a lecture about FAIR, you say in 45 minutes, three times, that FAIR is not the same as open, that it means accessible under well-defined conditions. And the first question is a doctor or whoever, I cannot make my data open, I'm a doctor. Well, what did I just tell you? You don't make your data open, you decide you can visit them. The pharma is making data internally FAIR, that doesn't mean they make them open. They're even thinking about trading their data now because you can have access under all kinds of conditions, including quality conditions and co-author. Or even, right. yeah, that's, that's very important. Very good, very good. Um, and before we let Betsy go and introduce Lindsay and ask Lindsay to ad address this question. Betsy, I thought you let the IRBs off a little lightly. Shouldn't there be a little tick box on their chart which says, what is the likelihood of 400 patients being recruited? But anyhow, we'll let that go. Yeah, Lindsay. I mean, oh, oh, sorry. No, 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 Betsy, if you, if, if, by all means, I, come back and then Lindsay. I think IRBs have perverse incentives because they are members of an institution whose prestige will be increased if one of these underpowered studies happens to be a blockbuster result. And so I think, I think really there needs to be more top-down organization and that IRB boards are not the right place for these decisions to be housed. You're telling me an IRB is conflicted. That's another interesting discussion. Maybe, <laughs> maybe for the cucumber sandwiches session after, after the end of this meeting. Lindsay, you've been very patient. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that you're bringing up the rear on this question, but we're looking forward to hearing your views. How has the COVID-19 pandemic affected the way the clinical research community shares data, both yes and no, good and bad? Yeah, no, thank you, John. And I mean, tremendous points from Baron and Betsy. And, you know, I think... Uh, so, by the way, I'm based in San Francisco, California. The World Economic Forum is headquartered uh, in Geneva, but I'm at our policy lab. So I have a bit I've had a bit more of a U.S. centric view on COVID. And of course, California is a hotspot and we've had all sorts of fascinating 
developments. And when I think about the impact on the clinical research community, you know, the first word that comes to mind is humility. Uh, you know, I, I think sort of it's been an opportunity to point out how we need to adopt new models to work together better. Um, you know, I specialize in genomic data policy specific to rare disease, and the number of parallels between barriers to data sharing and rare disease that have come out in COVID uh, has been fascinating. You know, really, we, you know, for instance, on the sample pool, when you're working on rare disease data access at a, at a global level, you have to go to a global level because your sample size is so small. You know, you may be dealing with a patient who has a disease, you know, the only person in Northern California, but if you scale that up to a global level, there's tens of thousands of people with that same disease, right? And so you have to be able to access one another's clinical records and beyond. It, it's really, you know, what's at stake to help that patient. And we get so much pushback on that in implementing new policy frameworks to try to allow for a greater um, level of, of data access globally. And, you know, what will it take, if not COVID, to allow for a global approach to disease management? When will we sort of realize that we don't need to have all of the answers and all of the data in an individual hospital or an individual research ecosystem and that it's okay to look to other countries and, you know, try to create just more of a, a communicative uh, ecosystem, so to speak. You know, I, I just think it's fascinating. We need to sort of rethink how we handle complex disease cases. And this has been a great opportunity to see that uh, in a really clear way. And, uh, you know, one interesting in terms of how it's facilitated data sharing, uh, I've been involved with the COVID-19 Healthcare Coalition here in the U.S., which is led by um, Mayo Clinic, and they really quickly figured out that they could use a uh, federated data system, as we discussed, to, to visit data, uh, clinical data across hospitals in an anonymized fashion. Um, and I hope that continues. Uh, but that's sort of been, I think, top of mind for many people and not something that we've done uh, in real time. And, and I hope that continues. Um, in terms of how it's hindered uh, data and, and knowledge sharing, I, I totally agree with, with Betsy. I think the impact on clinical trials is, is going to continue on. Um, and also just from a, you know, my wheelhouse, the impact on partnerships that were in the works you know, it, there were so many powerful partnerships that were sort of on the cusp of success, either in the rare disease space or the cancer space. And now those have all sort of, you know, the, the pause button has been pushed and it's unclear when resources will be reallocated. Now, especially that hospital budgets are pinched and, you know, revenue has been adversely impacted and, and so on. So I'm, I, I, you know, obviously we don't know, but what will that impact be on, on patients who don't get answers on their disease because partnerships and data, you know, data access didn't happen uh, because those partnerships just, just didn't continue on? Um, so, I, you know, pros and cons. Um, I just hope that we can really see how we need to work together more uh, on data sharing and data access and, and not let, like we've been talking about, sort of this it's my data approach, you know, uh, continue on and, and, and how can we sort of put what's at stake with, you know, saving lives and giving patients more answers at the forefront. Yes, and I, I think you're, the, you've made some, several, several extremely good points, but I'd rather like you clutching yourself at saying it's my data, because I think this is something <laughs> that the, the Baron um, ha and his colleagues, clearly, have managed to get this, um, this challenge out into the open. I can recall working in a major pharmaceutical company 20 years ago, and we were talking about trying to break down the culture. It's my lab, it's my data, you'll have it when I'm ready, to the mindset it's the company's lab, it's the company's data, and you should make it available. So I don't think what Barrett has done um, is, is actually new, except that he has managed to vitalize this whole subject and bring it to the forefront, bring it up to the mahogany row level in the biopharmaceutical industry, because they now understand 
fair, the findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, if we're going to use machines to read data to exploit the great god of AI, then fair has to be implemented. So uh, yeah, well, I think maybe all, all, sorry, all, my, all my panelists need to be con congratulated, but you know, th this I think is a, is a major, major achievement, Baron. Thank well, you very actually, much. You know that pharma also now, and also the Americans are better even in acronyms than the Europeans sometimes. They now also use uh, fair as fully AI ready. There we go. There we go. So right. That's also a nice right. way of looking at it. And I would, I would like to briefly react to one thing that came up in the chat. I know that's for later, but Ebola was mentioned in the chat. And what I'm very proud of, much more proud than anyone convinced in the pharma that, you know, that back, goes back to open facts, is that we got funding to create Vodan in a box, the virus data outbreak network, uh, the WHO CRF in RDF in fair format, and then a fair data point that can be installed uh, in half an hour. That spreads faster than the virus in US, uh, sorry, in, the, in, the, in Africa. You have Tunisia, Ethiopia, Zimbabwe, uh, Uganda, Nigeria, Kenya. They have already fair data points running. You know why they were so motivated to start and lead this time? Europe is trying to catch up. It is because when the Ebola epidemic was under control, 99, if not 100% of the data were taken by the donors that came to help. And the Africans cannot even access the data on their, quote, own epidemic anymore. So all the data are outside Africa now. And they are adamant that data on their health will never leave Africa anymore. They can be visited by machines. And they are equally able to send their trains or their virtual machines to Europe or the United States or China. And that will be a big power shift in science. And that's why some silverback scientists oppose there. Yes. Okay. Um, understood. Now, Betsy, um, a couple of things. First of all, we're going to move to the next question. Uh, and I'm going to ask you this question first. But before I ask you this question, I want you to consider something which maybe we can come back to in the, in the, uh, in the, in the tea garden um, discussion. And that is, um, if you like, uh, if I can use the term ethnic diversity in clinical trial subjects because I think that is not well done at the moment. It's not as well understood as it might be. And from a statistician's point of view, I think perhaps later on to have your perspective on that might be extremely helpful in the general case of clinical trials, also, of course, in, in COVID-19. Let's see, however, back to the agenda, if I may. And the question to you is this, what are the hurdles to sharing data and knowledge in clinical research? And in two categories, the scientific slash technological hurdles, if you will, and then also the societal and investment hurdles. And when I say society, I was hoping we might keep away from the political aspects, just the, the societal, cultural, that kind of uh, phenomena. So what are the hurdles to sharing data and knowledge in clinical research? Uh, I totally agree with what Baron said earlier that I think 90% of the reasons are social and not technical. I think the biggest hurdle by far, or I guess the biggest two hurdles are the way that research products are credited and inertia um, and a kind of sense of risk that I think is, is not tethered to reality. So I think um, the easiest Thing that we can work on, work to change going forward, is the incentive structure that at least in academia is aligned solidly against sharing. Um, we're in a situation where humanity benefits, but individual researchers suffer when they share data. Um, there's a, you know, all of the incentive is to hoard data and publish as many papers as you can on it before anybody else is allowed to, to make any discoveries from it. And I think there have been lots of really easy to implement solutions proposed, and I'm not actually sure why they haven't taken off, but I hope that COVID will be an, an impetus. Um, there are two proposals in particular that come to mind. Um, there's a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine from 2017 called um, Data Authorship as an Incentive for Sharing by Barbara Beer et al. Um, and the idea is that uh, 
collecting and cleaning and curating and maintaining data is given a, an authorship credit that travels with the data. And when the data are used by other parties, the original researchers who collected the data are getting credit for that use. Um, there was another paper that came out just this March in Science by um, Ida Sims et al. called Time for NIH to Lead on Data Sharing. I think that especially when federal money is funding research, it's imperative that the research be judged on how useful it is and not just how many papers it publishes, but real world use. Did this help, you know, for clinical trials? Did this help with clinical decision making? Was this data used to inform new standards of care? And that, that incentivizes sharing because that's not something that one author can do on their own. And the fact that, that right now credit is basically tied exclusively to authorship on papers is it's short-sighted. And I, I honestly don't understand why um, funding agencies like NIH haven't jumped on board requiring PIs to submit reports on, on broader uses of their data. But I hope that that's something, it's some, you know, I, I feel like I must be missing something because to me that seems like such low hanging fruit. I don't understand why it hasn't happened yet. I, I hope that it will happen going forward. And I, I, it's hard for me to see why, why it wouldn't. Um, so yeah, I think I'll leave, you know, I think the scientific and technological hurdles are real, but they're so minor in my mind compared to the cultural and systematic hurdles. I, I, I have great faith that we will be able to solve whatever scientific and technological hurdles arise. Um, I'm, I, so I would, well, I guess what I'm saying is I'm, I'm going to ignore that part of the question because <laughs> I think it's, it's the easier one to, to deal with and the one that I've thought less about. Okay, um, let's see. That's 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 good. So you're saying that we can solve the the, the technology. We can probably understand understand the science, but the human condition is still yet beyond us. And um, I think. I mean, I don't want to minimize it too much. I know that there are huge problems there. I just I, I, I have faith that that the scientists will be able to solve those problems. I think I, it's less clear to me that the the funding agencies, the, the governments, the bigger powers that be who control, the nebulous collective that controls the culture. It's less clear to me how that will change. Well, I think Cicero would have had exactly the same thoughts. So uh, <laughs> we, 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 have, we have this problem, which we have to overcome. Baron, you, if you want to come in now, please do, but you have to be brief because we have to talk past the talking stick next to Lindsay. Okay. So I just want to add one thing. I totally agree, of course, that, that most of it is cultural. But one thing that is frequently uh, ignored next to the, the horrible journal impact factor and supplementary data behind papers that I already mentioned is if funders and governments and so on would want data sharing or data visiting to happen, they need to invest in the underlying infrastructure. and. All the funders say, oh, we don't do the infrastructure, uh, NSF, NIH, we do top science. So I have the seven sins of open science and sin number seven is for funders. That is, everyone wants to pay for the rocket science and nobody wants to pay for the rocket launcher. Right. So we are right. still stuck with our rockets. Very so good. Invest so in the infrastructure. We're going to ask Marcia to make a note about that because that's another uh, tea time conversation with the with the, uh, the, the the post meeting activity but but that kind of data repository and the and the the records retention periods of those data repositories is a is a big topic which we shouldn't overlook lindsay um i i think if 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 we may the hurdles to sharing data and knowledge in clinical research betsy has said technology and science is simple people are difficult what's 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 your perspective yeah, I mean, I, I can't agree more, and I'm actually going to kind of combine Betsy and Barron's comments and, and summarize it with it's people and processes that that's the hurdle. Um, we actually just did a, a two year pilot at the World Economic Forum where um, it's called the Breaking Barriers to Health Data Project, looking at what does it take to establish a cross border genomic data system? 
And we partnered with four countries, the U.S., the U.K., uh, Australia, and Canada, all which you would assume have pretty sophisticated processes in place and systems in place and structured, machine-readable, genomic data uh, set up. And, you know, what does it take? And I, I have to say, it's all about the incentives, just like Betsy said. You know, it, it, we all agreed sort of a moral good to, uh, especially with a rare disease use case, to allow greater access to data because we can cut down the diagnostic odyssey. We can hopefully come up with better and more treatments for the 95% of people with a rare disease that don't have a treatment. You know, all of the moral incentives are there, but that's not enough. Um, we ended up doing an entire economic impact assessment, looking at, you know, okay, if you pay to invest in, for instance, a federated data system to set that up, to get APIs going, to structure your data in a way that's interoperable, you know, there, there actually is a return on investment, both in a clinical setting uh, and beyond. And I, I think, you know, one incentive that seems to constantly be referenced is, oh, we want to be innovative. We want to be at the top of the game. We want to make sure our institution is sort of world renowned. Um, and that's great. But, you know, if you want to do that, you have to actually, like Baron mentioned, put in the work and make sure your processes are, are top notch as well. And with that, I think the hardest part is having the ability to change your processes. You know, when you partner with someone, I think one of the best things that happens that we often don't recognize is you can learn from one another. You know, the way that Canada structures its electronic health records and the way that the U.S. structures its electronic health records uh, is different. That's not a bad thing. That's not something that can, you know, stop data access and data sharing from happening. Um, and I think often there's that, that initial reaction to say, you know, oh, boy, we do things differently. We can't invest in this. There's no incentive. But but there is, you know, you can improve the way you do things um, and you, you aren't necessarily already doing them the best way possible is also, I think, a realization. And the only thing other thing I'll mention um, is on the societal side is also I, I'm fascinated by the role of benefit sharing. And I think if that were a bit more front and center, we we might see more proofs of concepts of successful, you know, data sharing partnerships. Uh, I did a lot of stakeholder interviews with patient advocacy groups on this project because when you're dealing with sensitive health data like genomic data, the first question you'd think you'd get is, well, what's the risk of a, of a data breach, you know, of my, my patient privacy? What's the security of this system? Um, but actually, the number one reaction I got was, when will I hear more information on my disease? That's all I want. You can know my first name. You can know my last name. You can know my birthday. I don't care if that gets leaked. Just give me answers on my disease. Um, and I don't think that's where many um, of genomic institutes or hospital systems or researchers stand, right? We, we always jump to this conclusion that it's all about data security, which is still important. Don't get me wrong. Um, but, you know, I, so... What if instead the, you know, we, we improve our systems to also offer, uh, you know, better feedback on, okay, your data was used in X study, and from your data we learned this. That would be really interesting. Um, and also really, I think, encourage greater participation and greater data volumes from more people uh, and, and amplify discoveries that way. So I, I, I definitely agree. I think the scientific and technical hurdles really aren't what's necessarily stopping it. Maybe the processes internally and sort of, you know, making sure your, your technology systems are, are as best as they possibly could be. But it's really a people question. And, you know, having a negotiation process, having a partnership come into being takes a lot of conversations and a lot of time investment that I think many organizations don't realize and also aren't necessarily always willing to give the time to make that happen. Lindsay, um, thank you very much indeed. And sort of lots of questions immediately spring to mind, which I don't think I'm going to ask you because we don't have time. But I think sort of uh, the culture of medicine varies from country to country. So comparing information across different data sets, I think is, is, is something that needs to be borne in mind. And the other thing you mentioned about sort of the, the disease odyssey, that genomics may decrease that. But, you know, is the medical profession 
sufficiently agile to update its disease taxonomy in light with the new information that is coming from, from the genome revolution. But maybe we can come to that at, 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 at tea time because, um, okay. Baron, we need in, 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 the, in the interest of fairness, Baron, we need to ask you this question. And <laughs> what are the hurdles to sharing data and knowledge in, in clinical research, scientific, technological, societal investment? trying to avoid the political if we can? Well, I think most has been said. I think that the, uh, the hurdles for clinical research are, of course, slightly different from you know, any other generic research where patient privacy and so on is not uh, in, the, in the question. But I think, on the other hand, that if there is any area where distributed learning and distributed analytics has already been proven to work, it is in clinical research. So even there, my major fight in the last year has not been with technologists or with any kind of scientists. It has been with the doctors. And they say, oh, I cannot do that. I cannot do that. And you punch and you punch and you punch and come back to, I think Betsy said it, oh, this is my personal source of nature paper. I don't, yeah. And I have many reasons to say, oh, that's why I cannot share them. But every time you take away one of these hurdles, technically, they have another one. So I think really it comes all back to 90% maybe of the challenges, as we already said in our high level expert group report for the European Open Science Cloud, they are social and there is to surprise maybe when hype became a, when fair became a hype term we have 3000 citations almost on the paper now there is so much lip service to fair well i'm fair because i have this pdf that everyone can find it's open access and everybody can read it oh did you really read the paper even when you cited it no you didn't and even in the european open science cloud where fair is center stage on every policy document, the people that actually try to hijack the European Open Science Cloud, they of course have to pay lip service to FAIR, but they do everything the wrong way and they have apparently not read the paper. So there is a lot of opposition against FAIR, but always from those publishers that lose their monopoly position, from the chips of and the epics that I already put in the chat that are losing their, in, at least in their perception, their monopoly uh, and their vendor lock-in position. And don't forget the silverback scientists because they keep this journal impact factor bloody hurrah in, in space. And they say, oh, Plan S cannot go through because my good scientists will go to the United States. Uh, why would I publish in Seoul, you know? or in nature with the highest refraction rate ever. <laughs> so, I mean, we have to break through this hegemony of the old systems and that is tough, very tough. But we need to go there and let me finalize my comment with a statement of my good friend, George Strong, who just turned 80. He started NSFnet. He was the one responsible for forcing TCP IP against all odds and Everyone was against it. So he will soon publish a paper. And one statement I love, I spoke to him at his 80th birthday. He said, the internet brought us from the situation from many computers and many data sets to the situation of one computer and many data sets. The internet of fair data and services will bring us to one computer and one data set. For virtual machines, it's trivial where the data are, as long as they can visit them, visit them with light speed. It's not very good. That's the point. Very good, Barrett. Absolutely. So um, thank you very much indeed for that. And we have yet another question. The questions are endless this afternoon. Um, and uh, just so we we warn the, our panelists, we're going to have Lindsay trying to address this question first. And then we'll move on to Baron and then to, to, to Betsy. The question is absolutely straightforward. What is needed to make data and knowledge sharing more effective and more the norm? Lindsay. Yeah, so the, 
Absolutely. So, um, I mean, this may be oversimplifying it, but I just wonder, do we just need more proofs of concept? Do we need just more examples so that there is sort of this, speaking of incentives, the incentive that you're the only one not sharing data, so you need to catch up and join the club and be part of the party, you know? Um, I, I think it's fascinating. We So I just, uh, with the forum, published what I hope is is helpful, an eight-step guide to share genomic data, which walks through the people and the processes and sort, and only six, so six steps are people, only two are technical, which I think is, is very telling. Um, but, you know, going back to my specialization in, in genomics, in the last seven years, we've had 14 countries invest, um, it's over now, $4 billion uh, USD in national genomic initiatives. That's really exciting. That's huge. You know, the, the, the volumes of genomic data are not going anywhere. They're only increasing. But not a single national genomics initiative that I'm aware of uh, has invested in a mechanism to share that data with another country. It's all about how can I as a nation amass genomic data for my own use. When, you know, rare disease doesn't discriminate based on nationality. Cancer does not discriminate based on nationality. Um, we, you know, the, the differences in our processes aren't going away. And I think we're still sort of ignoring um, on that. And there's great organizations like the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health that are working to sort of try to create international standards. I'm not saying it's not happening and, and that work is, is, is brilliant. Um, but I think there's a real opportunity to, you know, with initial samples and, and you know, good samples of, of a productive data sharing partnership and data access partnership, I should say, like if we can just propel that and, and make that the norm, you know, it would be great if when we start these, these data biobanks, if there was already the assumption, let's set it up in a way that it's not a data lake where everything is unstructured, but rather a system that allows outside collaboration and, you know, with that can amplify and, and add greater value to the data itself. Um, so, I, th that's my hope. It may be overly optimistic, but it would be great if, you know, we could get a, a bit more ex examples to spur um, greater interest in, in global data access. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Baron, over well, to you. What is the approach? approach is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Same question. So let me approach it from a scientist, from a scientist's point of view. Uh, we are very stubborn and um, hard-headed people. And there's two points in the life cycle of a scientist's life where he or she listens to other people. First is when I want to get funding. Second, when I want to publish. We'll jump through any hoop. So the funders have to require fair data. And I'm proud that the Dutch government did that for COVID for now. 40 million euros was spent by Zon and Wees, small funder, small country. 40 million dollars was, uh, euros was just spent. Every single project that was awarded needed to budget 5% for data stewardship. And they all got from a central fund a fair data point to store their data. And if they did not agree, they simply would not get the funding. That's one thing. The publishing hegemony should be broken through kill the journal impact factor, prohibit supplementary data, publish data with a supplementary article. If those two things change and the award system as you heard, there is a chance that this will happen. Okay, And invest in core resources like the Uniprods and the curated databases and invest in an infrastructure for data sharing. And that's the major hurdle because it's not sexy Good infrastructure, only when it works, you never see it until the tap doesn't give water or you don't get electricity, ah, oh, you panic. So we need to go to the point where data comes out of your wall as a routine. But there is a big infrastructure under that and we have to pay for it. And it is ridiculously low. Elixir has found out that if we spend indeed on average 5% on data stewardship, and every modern research group, for every 20 data spitters, we have a professional data steward. And that's 
what we need to do, uh, then it will work. And that my last comment would be that if you want to convince the bureaucrats, and I'm not only talking the bureaucrats in Brussels or at World Economic Forum forever, I mean, even my dean. I'll give you a last anecdote. We were trying to convince my dean at Leiden University to hire 50 data stewards for the Leiden University Medical Center. Oh, are you crazy? Well, that's you know needed because we have 1,500 people. So we were actually taking 75, but we <coughs> said, okay, let's so let's say 50. Half an afternoon, everybody tried to convince him, no result. You know what helped? One person finally was so desperate said, Pankras, that's his name. If you don't do this, the risk of not acting, if you don't do this, you will soon be the University of Katwijk, which is this little fisherman's village next to Leiden. I use it in every lecture now. If a university asks me to come to speak about data sharing and fair, said, give me some backwards village close to your university. So in Delft, I say, you know, this village, and you should do the same for Oxford and Cambridge and whatever, because the dean should understand that if they want to enter the era where the machine is our major analyst, still in our service, soon we will be in its service maybe, if Harari gets his way, but you know, we better make data understandable for these machines. And you. if you don't do it, you will lose. The same is true for farming. If you don't move in this direction, you can close shop pretty soon and we will need archaeology to find what the term pharmacological in, uh, industry meant, you know? In Aaron, you're, you're, you're right, but fortunately the pharmaceutical industry has been reading your book and is taking 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 steps. To make They're sure moving faster it. than academia, I'm surprised. It's, it's, it's verified, absolutely. Betsy, thank you, Baron. Betsy, what is needed to make data and knowledge sharing more effective and more the norm? Yeah, I agree that we need requirements at the funding and publication level and that that is the, the quickest and most direct path in this direction. I also, um, I think that I would go slightly further than Berend and say that I really think those requirements should be for open and not just accessible data. This does raise a whole host of other issues. It makes it much more complicated, but I worry about allowing data stewards to be gatekeepers at any point in the process. Um, so I, I think, you know, requiring, requiring data to be available in a way that removes the original data collector as a gatekeeper is, is going to be crucial for getting, for na circumnavigating all of the human <laughs> issues that are, are really the strongest barriers. And then just to avoid repeating everything that Lindsay and Barron said that I totally agree with, I would just make the point that I think some of the problems can be solved by um, ground up movements like FAIR, but some of it really does require top down organization. So for example, the problem of clinical trials that proliferate without any individual IRB being able to adjudicate a, a proposed trial in the in the context of the full landscape. I think um, I, I'm much more um, sanguine about solving the problems that can be solved by individual scientists uh, coming up with novel ideas, promoting them to their networks, and eventually they'll catch on. I don't know how to get top-down leadership from WHO, NIH, to avoid a lot of the problems that we've seen with COVID that just can't be solved by, by ground-up operations. Right. But right. how are you going to convince those top-down organizations to almost go against their silverback scientists by doing this because they they're you saw what plan s was you know there was this whole movement against it and some of the silverback scientists chose to choose the side of those of you so we yeah. need to break through this this old-fashioned way of doing science and that's that's not going to be easy george said to me take a decade yeah i i I agree, and I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I guess I would. 
I would hope that, again, a postmortem of COVID will leave people so horrified by what went wrong that <laughs> there will be more will to change things going forward, but time will tell. Very good, very good. So, um, well, well, panel, I think you've done extremely well on, on these, these three seminal questions, which has taken us to the, the tea time hour. And I'm going to ask Marcia now, who is in charge of all this, <laughs> what, what she would like us to do next. Marcia. Well, yeah, thank you everyone for um, coming along to this really engaging discussion. It's going to continue in the uh, session we call the tea garden, but actually, John, I like your earlier name of calling it the rose garden so ah, yes, <laughs> it's yes, more flowery yes. right but, uh, this is... abuse and get presidential <laughs> speeches now <laughs> yes, yeah. I'm, 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 i've lost track of where i am <laughs> so we're so, going to continue the, the um, conversation and we invite everybody who stays to um turn on your camera cameras and um engage in a conversation um, I mean, you don't have to, but it'd be really good if you could. And um, John, you posed a question that you wanted us to go back to. Um, and in fact, there's two questions I think we should go back to that you raised. One about diversity in clinical trials, and the second one about data repository and data retention. I think we can pick up on those and get the conversation flowing. Very good. So I think I think diversity. That I mean, to a certain extent, that's a statistical problem. It's, there are other other aspects to it as well. So I, let's start off with Betsy because she understands the t test, which is more than most of us do, I suspect. Betsy. Great. So just to to make explicit why it's a statistical problem, the issue is that if different subgroups, it could be. You know, th these subgroups could be anything, but you pointed specifically to, um, I, I think you were pointing to the problem of, you know, research subjects tend to overrepresent um, often middle class, white, European, and people of European descent. And if there's treatment effect heterogeneity across subgroups that are not represented in clinical populations, then we miss signal that would tell us uh, about, first of all, about how we might want to make different clinical decisions in different settings. Second of all, how we might want to make global recommendations. So this is something WHO has to really worry about because they want to make recommendations that should apply to the whole world, but they're often basing that on data that overrepresents certain populations. Um, so yes, I think data sharing is crucial to this. This picks up on some themes that Lindsay's mentioned throughout that in, in lots of cases, it's impossible to answer the most important scientific questions without collaborating and sharing data. It's just impossible for a single research group to get a truly representative sample for the global population. And there are, you know, obviously there are research consortia and multi-site trials, and there are ways around this that can still be governed by the silverback scientists, but the, a much more efficient and um, readily available solution is to allow research to continue to be local but make sure that the products are global and that local research is on that that whenever it's possible for local research products to be brought together to form a more powerful base of evidence that that is feasible <laughs> and then the i think the will to do it is there the problem is that at this point it's just usually not feasible Right, right. And if I could ask um, Lindsay, you're, you're, you're thinking about this, how, how do we get better ethnic uh, diversity represented in clinical programs, most of which really are run out of the USA and, and Europe. If you look at the, at the map of clinical trials, those two regions are, sort of, you know, they have a, a great deal of work and other regions have less work. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think one prime example of this is also just that the reference genome uh, uh, is entirely representative, really, of a U.S. and European population. And how in the world does that, you know, adversely impact what we think are discoveries, but actually don't apply to the global south of the world? 
Um, so, you know, it's a fascinating question. I mean, I, I do believe that uh, there is a role for education and for benefit sharing. So we were lucky enough at our offices here in San Francisco to have a fellow from the Ministry of Health in Rwanda uh, sit next to me for 18 months and um, in an effort to develop a, a custom genomic data policy for the government of Rwanda. Because, you know, when you copy and paste policies for other countries, it doesn't work. Uh, there's just different cultural contexts, different expectations that you can't make assumptions on. And one thing that I find fascinating is, is wh why do people participate in clinical trials? Why, you know, wh what is the desire? Um, is it for your individual disease? Is it for the greater good uh, or something in between? And um, with that, how can you have, uh, you know, more variation in the expectations for participation? One model I really like that I think will increase diversity in clinical trials is out of Australian genomics. They have a, a, a dynamic consent platform called CTRL or control, and it lets you really complete a comprehensive survey when you give over your data. You know, I, I want it to go to a hospital system. I want it to go to, you know, I don't want pharma to ever touch it. Uh, you know, you can be very explicit. In, and also, if you want to hear back, you know, sometimes you don't, if, if there's an incidental finding, you don't want to know. Uh, I personally would love to know. I think it's fascinating, but I understand why people don't want that sort of gray cloud hanging over their head. Um, so I think it just has to come down to not homogenizing, you know, a global population and trying to think through um, not making assumptions on what every single participant in a clinical trial wants. So there's the education side of how do you actually reach people and help them understand what you're doing in layman's terms, which is always a bridge. Uh, Genomics England, I'm sorry, Australian Genomics and Genomics England have really done great strides in that to make, uh, you know, consent forms. I believe that an eight-year-old can read Genomics England's form. It's, it's a young age, which is very impressive. Um, and, and that's a part of it. But then it's also the flip side of what do you do once you have the data and how do you, you, you treat, you know, a participant in, in your study? And is there a benefit provided if desired? So I, I really see two sides of the coin. But I just hope that it could be, you know, more of a collaborative relationship. Um, I can say that I've given my data, you know, to numerous studies, uh, uh, rare disease studies, and never hear back, which is okay. Um, but wouldn't it be nice if that was not the standard? Um, and would that, uh, you know, in hand convince, you know, all my family and friends to be way more open with contributing their data? So a bit of a, you know, push and pull there. And I, I'm not sure that we're necessarily ready for a, a, a change like that. And I do wonder if something as sensitive as genomic data can lead the way in exploring new models uh, for engagement, because I, you know, I think that's what it really comes down to is, is outreach, engagement, and, and everything in between improving. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Parent. Well, I mean, I am a geneticist by training, and I, I would like to, to make one additional comment. We have gone through a lot of discussions in the early days of the beacons and, and global alliance and so on. And with Johan den Dunn in, in our lab in Leiden, who leads this whole, you know, popularization of DNA very much, one of the things we found out that, yes, people, the, one of the most important incentives for people to give positive consent on reuse of their data is feedback in general. I would har actually argue that the closest exception I found is genetics, because when we discussed with Andrew Sue and others years ago, to feed back information on variants in the genome to actual citizens, we found out very quickly that a lot of them didn't want to know because it is extremely difficult for the average layperson to judge the value of an X percent chance on this particular disease when you get 40 years old. Should I amputate my breast? Should I whatever? All these crazy ideas that people get. So be very careful that on the one hand, feeding back results to the citizens that gave consent is critical. And it's a very big incentive for many interested citizens and also creating citizen science. They can actually contribute also in our trusted world of Corona. There is a whole section on citizen science. Parents of rare disease children 
they are the best. They have all day long, they will explore data to find the cure for their kid. But the genetics thing is so dangerous because it is it requires real knowledge to understand the relative risk of a particular variant. And if a paper comes out, oh, this variant is now GWAS associated with some horrible thing, panic. And there is no panic at all because it's one of 400 genes in the region that, that relates to the disease. Come on. So it's, it's not easy for people to interpret genetics data, especially if it's about their own genome. So no, I, th I, I think it's in, I mean, um, the, the, the Pistoia Alliance ran an outreach initiative to Singapore 18 months ago, and we were talking to some senior leaders of ASTAR, the life sciences, about uh, issues. Uh, and one of the comments came was that, you know, the biggest unmet medical need was the Asian phenotype. And it was that comment that which really made me think how skewed we are in our clinical development programs to, 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 to the Western phenotype, if, if, if I could be so, so simplistic. Um, moving on. Uh, yes, yeah, so in the UK, and there are some sort of experts. I mean, I know uh, Professor Goble from Manchester is deeply expert in this, but the grant giving bodies insist that data is collected and uh, uh, deposited when it's in support of a, of a publication. Now, in principle, this is something, Baron, I think you might, might approve of. But in practice, coming from, a, from a, not an academic background so much, but more as a sort of industrial background where, um, you know, I, it, it might be said that, um, it, that we're sort of always aware of, of cost, where some of our academic colleagues seem to be not quite so aware of cost as we are in industry. <laughs> it takes money to look after data. And also what we know in industry is data ages. So the data we collect today may not be particularly useful to the data we collect in 10 years time. Next generation sequencing, whatever next is now, will be N plus five or six in 10 years time. So can we be, will we be comparing apples with apples or apples with pears? So if we are going to have these data repositories, should there not be some kind of data management protocol assigned to it? So if the data is not used, not accessed, if it is aging, then we can get rid of it because we save the cost. And if we need to get it again, then we could get it again. Well, okay, two, two things there. That's why I hate the term data management. It always upsets me. We should use the term data stewardship. So stewardship means throwing away things that are stale, you know, as well. On the other hand, storing a petabyte of data is 180,000 per year. Now it's served in the Netherlands, but in five years time, it will be trivial. And when we switch to DNA, we go make a jump of 10 to the 19th times more efficient. So we can store the entire internet data on a kilogram of DNA. So it's not the storage as such. Eh? You have the super tape of DNA. You can store an endless amount of data, whether they're still useful, uh, time will teach but what is more important is that people always ask me about fair and quality of data and I always say fair doesn't say anything about quality I can make perfectly synthetic fake data and make them fair yeah. but yeah. but the provenance is important and again for these lay people this morning on the movie I said okay I want to know with which instrument a particular sequence was created if I now get data from a decade or two decades or whatever of, of, of sequencing and I get a cluster that answers to my uh, hypothesis and there is 20 outliers and they were all sequenced with the first Illumina machine with a 30% uh, error rate, then the chances are that these outliers just the, the mutation I'm looking at was not detected by these old machines because they were all in the, in the error, error margin. So then I know that this part of the data is probably not of low quality per se in the sense in, in those days it was the best data you could get. But it is an, ex, an explanation of the aberrant result I find now. And machines should be able to detect that cluster of outliers and see the commonality that they were all made with old 
Illumina machines or whatever machines. I don't want to <laughs> be here commercial or whatever. And then the machine could warn me and say, look, this is probably an irrelevant outlier cluster because they're all old and probably there were sequencing mistakes. So I can exclude the data. That is data stewardship. Rich metadata, you read the FAIR principles, make rich provenance, rich metadata, so that I can filter data. Self-reporting on step counters, very low quality data. You forget your smartphone when you make a walk, all these things. But if I do two billion smartphones, I still get the correlation between more steps, less heart attacks. So, um, let's see, any, any thoughts on, on data aging, cost of data retention or would you like to move on to thinking about what wearable devices um, will do for clinical trials of the future and how wearable devices are being useful now in COVID-19 and clinical trials, the subject doesn't necessarily have to go to the principal investigators, academic medical center to get measured. They could use their Apple smartwatch or Fitbit or some other technology. What's, what's your thinking on these, on, on, on these various topics? Well, that came out of left field, but I actually have thought a bit about um, wearable computing because some of my colleagues work very closely on that kind of data. I think that um, we, we don't yet fully understand either the, the errors built into most wearable devices, especially one, the ones that are made for commercial and not research purposes, and that we don't yet understand exactly what it is that they're measuring and what it what it's a useful biomarker for. So I think we have to be really careful about using it as an endpoint in um, studies that are going to inform immediate clinical decision making. I think that wearable devices are really useful for collecting data that's going to be used either in exploratory analyses or in understanding disease processes. I don't, my personal opinion is that it's not ready for clinical decision-making research. Um, and that Oops. in COVID, we're in a situation where we product to the clinical decision instantaneously, sometimes in the time lapse is negative. And that makes me um, a little concerned about using endpoints that are, are not fully understood when, when decision making is already being made in ways that I think are, are too, are ill considered and too fast and missing some, a lot of the subtlety and details, um, introducing that extra complication worries me. Right, right. Um, okay, I would like to see if it might be possible to involve a, a member of, of the audience. And I was wondering if um, it might be possible to ask Professor Alessandra Renieri a question. Uh, and, and the question, this is, uh, I'm informed, the question to be asked, I'm informed by very reliable people that the question to be asked is, Professor Alessandra Renieri, what did you do with your COVID-19 data? And if we could uh, find the professor and ask the professor to unmute and explain to us, that would be very interesting. Hello, hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you for involving me in this uh, very interesting debate. Um, <clears throat> uh, we are trying with, uh, with our data, uh, we, we have collected the uh, 1100 of uh, uh, <clears throat> COVID uh, um, patients, uh, uh, 25 of them are uh, asymptomatic or partially symptomatic and we are uh, we have sequenced them, them, <clears throat> and uh, we um, we we would like to um, understand the genetic basis of uh, the um, uh, host response and clinical outcome. Uh, so we we are uh, we, we have developed developed a, a new method that could be able to, to uh, predict. Uh, um, with a, a, right now, with 80% 80, 80 of precision, sensitivity, and uh, uh, specificity, 
the clinical outcome, meaning that uh, if you will be a, a, a pouch symptomatic or asymptomatic or severely affected patients. And uh, we really uh, think that we, um, we, we need to, to share this uh, method and we, we need to validate with the other courts. So um, I uh, very much appreciated your thought about the data sharing and the uh, results sharing at the global level. Um, because this, this, this is a challenge, we, we, we needed to face uh, this challenge at the global level, otherwise, otherwise we are lost. And, uh, and so, um, uh, thank you for, for, for this uh, kind of uh, webinar. And uh, I hope also to, to have uh, an help from, from all of you in order to, um, to, 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 to share with other courts uh, our method in order to validate the, the method and to, and to eventually use uh, the method for uh, um, social and uh, health uh, uh, um, approaches uh, and uh, in order to, to face uh, a bit better with this uh, big challenge. Very good. Thank you very much, Professor. And, and are these methods written up? Is there somewhere where we can access them and, and read them and understand them and uh, critique them? Yeah, yes, we, 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 we will... Um, I can share with, with you uh, what is necessary very soon. That, that would be extremely helpful. If you could make sure that the Marcia gets the, gets the right link, then I'm sure we'll be able to get that to the, to the audience of, of, of this webinar. Thank, thank you. Thank you for, for that uh, in, in, in input. Uh, John, John uh, yes. due, to, thank due you. to the circumstances I mentioned before, I need to leave in a minute. But, okay, Barrett. Uh, I, I would be first of all interested in these data we just heard about, but we are also working on so-called conceptual models, in which you can test drugs, rationalize drugs before going to in vitro. So I will also be able to share those very quickly, and they can only improve when we get people. So what we will do soon in the hotel, the talk hotel, just the world of Corona, we'll bring these models on with 275 databases integrated. Uh, already from the human protein atlas to everything and people can simply dr dump their drug into that system and see what happens uh, as a first step towards uh, actual uh, testing in vitro and I just know I'm coming uh, so uh, I think this group could actually hopefully in some way shape or form stick together to exchange these highly advanced uh, methods so that we can serve the world with uh, much faster rationalization of, uh, for example, existing drugs. We predicted dexamethasone, uh, tocilizumab, and we predicted also that hydroxychloroquine would be a waste in the machine. Right. So, yeah. So Very then good. I, sorry that I have to leave, but I enjoyed it a lot and uh, I hope that we stay in contact. Okay. Baron, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And uh, I, I hope things will, work out um, well for, 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 for you and your family. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Marcia, are there any other, other questions that we should um, ask Betsy and Lindsay to address before we bring the uh, webinar yeah. to a close? Yeah, I was wondering if Lindsay wanted to say more about um, benefit sharing. She touched on it um, earlier in the um, conversation, but I was just wondering if you want to elaborate more on that, um, Lindsay? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so actually I can, I can a bit, um, you know, draw, uh, draw in the wearables conversation on that because I've done a lot of thinking on, on wearables, uh, the value of wearables and, and benefit sharing. So, you know, I, I just wonder if we can um, really continue to involve uh, patients a bit more in research. You know, I'm very sensitive to Barron's comments that, right, we can't go, uh, you know, giving everybody, you know, f uh, fearful reactions to data that may change or evolve as, you know, early genomics sort of research continues to be more uh, sophisticated as the, you know, software gets fancier and also the sequencing machines. But I do think there, they can handle it, you know? 
Uh, maybe that's more so in the rare disease or cancer space. But if we're thinking about a future of genomic medicine as, you know, the end game, there has to be an opportunity for just greater information sharing in general, as well as in, you know, sort of a, a clinical trial setting or any sort of data contribution setting. Um, I, you know, especially in the U.S., reading through some uh, consent forms is a bit of a, a scary feat. You know, everyone just flips right through them. You sign, date, move on. Uh, you know, you don't really pay attention to what they say. But what if instead it was an actual, you know, engaging process and one that was exciting and you knew exactly what you were giving up and and when and to wearables, you know, I think it's fascinating. We we did a wearables for COVID project at the World Economic Forum, thinking about what if we did a push notification to an Apple Watch to, with two sentences, essentially say, you can access this consent form explaining why how we're going to use the data and potentially give it to the state of California for one case study. And we we sort of assumed no one would click that form, right? When you're reading through Apple stuff, you never you never read the, all of that boilerplate. It's too long, and so you just you trust the company, you trust Apple, and you trust in their consent form. Um, will that get sticky with wearable data uh, as it continues to get more sophisticated? And I, I I do wonder if wearable data, you know, is not the right approach for say sophisticated biomarkers. I totally agree with with Betsy on that. I don't know if that's really the future. But what if instead it was used as an addition to your clinical record? Um, and I'll, I'll use myself as an example. Uh, I, you know, I have an orthopedic rare disease and my Apple Watch can text my orthopedist whenever I fall because I, I take some stumbles and they can be dangerous. Uh, that to me is really cool because that's a supplemental clinical record. Uh, instead of him asking me, you know, in a nerve wracking appointment, have you taken any falls and me glossing over the past and forgetting, he actually has a record. Uh, he has the proof in the pudding, so to speak, uh, without me having to sort of, you know, re recollect. Um, so I think it's fascinating, you know, we, we, we can use wearables and other really cool technological innovations to supplement data without being necessarily the end all be all of what we want and, you know, the most reliable source of truth, so to speak. Um, but I, I don't think there's necessarily, you know, it's not a bad thing to to share more information with patients and with with people who are contributing sensitive data, especially. Um, and I, I don't necessarily. Oh, yeah. There's a couple of questions I'd like to ask you on, on that. But before I do, I want to ask yeah. the audience if there are any burning questions that they would like to type into the chat window, because if they do, I'll, I'll look at them and, and read them out. But my my. My question, or perhaps, perhaps challenge to you, is that some of this real world, it depends on the medical condition, of course, but some of these um, real world data elements can be, I think, extraordinarily contributory to the uh, progression of scientific understanding and medical palliation of the human condition. If you take um, sort of neuromuscular disease phenomena, so for example, if one takes Parkinson's disease, then you, usually that is monitored by a visit to the doctor's office and a six minute walk test or something similar with some periodicity between uh, adventures out to the, to, the, to the doctor's office. If you give people a wearable, then you can have data about their physical condition, tremor, uh, seizure, all this kind of stuff 24 seven. And that gives the pharmaceutical industry enormous opportunity to test of compounds with a scientific basis that might treat the disease because the granularity is so much more profound. So I think that's particularly exciting. And then to talk about um, informed consent, patient engagement, is it not now possible, especially in these COVID-19 times, to imagine a consent which is informed by a video, which is signed electronically, all this could be managed, let's just say, with blockchain technology, so it, you know, it's all, you know, recorded the distributed ledger make sure it's not spoofed i mean aren't there some very exciting opportunities and covid19 is exciting some of the developments here could i yeah jump? absolutely and if anyone has any questions oh yeah go ahead yeah, no no go finish Lindsay, and then i'll go next <laughs> 
Oh, I was going to say the only the only additional make 10 seconds is also telehealth, I think, is transforming how patients allow their doctor to be in their home without being in their home and really doing, I think, fascinating psychological changes on what that means and uh, opening the door for that to happen. Absolutely, John. But, uh, that's you. Go ahead. Well, first, let me just say that I'm I'm very gung ho about wearable computing and wearable devices for all of the purposes that you guys mentioned. I, I think for for COVID specifically, it's less clear, but in these other settings, and especially in terms of giving patients more information that's useful to them as they participate in research, I think it's extremely promising. On the top of informed consent, I think this really, this is a, a an, un, um, an unmined force for data sharing, that when, when subjects agree to participate in clinical trials, they are often motivated by wanting to be as useful for as many people as possible. And I think that we are really doing, we're, I think it's, it's an ethical failing when, we, when researchers fail to make the data that they collected from individuals as useful as possible for as broad an audience as possible. And so I, I think that an obligation to share data responsibly and for as many useful scientific ends as possible should be baked into the way that we think about the, the ethical obligations that we as researchers enter into when we t accept patients' informed consent. Very good. Well, um, I think we're getting close to the bottom of the hour. And if I go over that, then I'm going to get reprimanded by Marcia. So I'm going to say thank you to Lindsay and thank you to Betsy and certainly thank you to, to Barron who's had to leave us. And I shall pass over control of the meeting to, to Marcia. Marcia, to you. Well, thank you everyone for attending this really fascinating webinar. It's been an engaging discussion. So thank you, John, for your leadership in, in keeping everybody in order. Betsy and Lindsay and uh, for Baron, who's left us. Um, we have another one of the webinars in the next series. Unfortunately, I don't have a date with me, but if you go to the website, it will be there. We will also be sending out um, uh, um, a survey. So please fill that in because we're always interested to get the feedback. In fact, if you go to the chat, chat box now, the feedback form is there. Um, we're always looking to what we can do better and improve and suggestions for future topics as well. And I think without further ado, just want to thank everybody for attending. Thank you to the panel. It's been a fantastic uh, discussion. The video of this will be available in a few days. Um, and so look on the website for that. And without further ado, just want to say goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.